Chapter 16, Reading. We are towed by steam launch, irritating behavior of small boats, how they get in the way of steam launches, George and Harris again shirk their work, rather a hackneyed story, Streetly and Goring. We came in sight of Reading about 11. The river is dirty and dismal here. One does not linger in the neighborhood of Reading. The town itself is a famous old place dating from the dim days of King Ethelred, when the Danes anchored their warships in the Kennet and started from Reading to ravage all the land of Wessex. And here Ethelred and his brother Alfred fought and defeated them, Ethelred doing the praying and Alfred the fighting. In later years, Reading seems to have been regarded as a handy place to run down to when matters were becoming unpleasant in London. Parliament generally rushed off to Reading whenever there was a plague on at Westminster, and in 1625, the law followed suit, and all the courts were held at Reading. It must have been worthwhile having a mere ordinary plague now and then in London to get rid of both the lawyers and the Parliament. During the parliamentary struggle, Reading was besieged by the Earl of Essex and, a quarter of a century later, the Prince of Orange routed King James's troops there. Henry I lies buried at Reading, in the Benedictine Abbey founded by him there, the ruins of which may still be seen, and in this same abbey, Great John of Gaunt was married to the Lady Blanche. Blanche? Blanche. At Reading Lock, we came up with a steam launch belonging to some friends of mine, and they towed us up to within a, about a mile of Streetly. It is very delightful being towed up by a launch. I prefer it myself to rowing. The rum would have been more delightful still if it had not been for a lot of wretched small boats that were continually getting in the way of our launch, and to avoid running down which, we had to be continually easing and stopping. It is really most annoying the manner in which these rowing boats get in the way of one's launch up the river. Something ought to be done to stop it. And there, and they are so confoundedly impertinent too over it. You can whistle till you nearly burst your boiler before they will trouble themselves to hurry. I would have one or two of them run down now and then if I had my way, just to teach them all a lesson. The river becomes very lonely from a little above Reading. The railway rather spoils it near Tilehurst, but from Maple Durham up to Streetly it is glorious. A little above Maple Durham Lock you pass Hardwick House, where Charles I played bowls. The neighborhood of Pangbourne, where the quaint little Swan Inn stands, must be as familiar to the habitués of the art exhibitions as it is to its own inhabitants. My friend's launch cast us loose just below the grotto, and then Harris wanted to make out that it was my turn to pull. This seemed to me most unreasonable. It had been arranged in the morning that I should bring the boat up to three miles above Reading. Well, here we were ten miles above Reading. Surely it was now their turn again. I could not get either George or Harris to see the matter in its proper light, however, so to save argument, I took the skulls. I had not been pulling for more than a minute or so when George noticed something black floating on the water, and we drew up to it. George leant over as we neared it and laid hold of it, and then he drew back with a cry and a blanched face. It was the dead body of a woman. It lay very lightly on the water, and the face was sweet and calm. It was not a beautiful face. It was too prematurely aged looking, too thin and drawn to be that. But it was a gentle, lovable face in spite of its stamp of a pinch in poverty. And upon it was that look of restful peace that comes to the faces of the sick, sometimes when the last, the pain has left them. Fortunately for us, we having no desire to be kept hanging about coroner's courts, some men on the bank had seen the body too, and now took charge of it from us. We found out the woman's story afterwards. Of course, it was the old old, ver vulgar tragedy. She had loved and had been deceived, or had deceived herself. Anyhow, she had sinned, some of us do now and then, and her family and friends, naturally shocked and indignant, had closed their doors against her. Left to fight the world alone, with the millstone of her shame around her neck, she had sunk ever lower and lower. 
For a while, she had kept both herself and the child on the twelve shillings a week that twelve hours drudgery a day procured her, paying six shillings out of it for the child and keeping her own body and soul together on the remainder. Six shillings a week does not keep body and soul together very unitedly. They want to get away from each other when there is only such a very slight bond as that between them, and one day, I suppose, the pain and the dull monotony of it all had stood before her eyes plainer than usual, and the mocking specter had frightened her. She had made one last appeal to friends, but against the chill wall of their respectability, the voice of the erring outcast fell unheeded. And then she had gone to see her child, had held it in her arms and kissed it, in a weary, dull sort of way, and without betraying any particular emotion of any kind, and had left it, after putting into its hand a penny box of chocolate she had bought it, and afterwards, with her last few shillings, had taken a ticket and come down to Goring. It seemed that the bitterest thoughts of her life must have centered about the wooded reaches and the bright green meadows around Goring, but women strangely hug the knife that stabs them, and perhaps admits the gall, there may have mingled also sunny memories of sweetest hours spent upon those shadow deeps over which the great trees bend their branches down so low. She had wandered about the woods by the river's brink all day, and then, when evening fell and the gray twilight spread its dusty robe upon the waters, she stretched her arms out to the silent river that had known her sorrow and her joy. And the old river had taken her into its gentle arms and had laid her weary head upon its bosom and had hushed away the pain. Thus had she sinned in all things, sinned in living and in dying, God help her, and all other sinners, if any more there be. Goring on the left bank and Streetly on the right are both or either charming places to stay at for a few days. The reaches down to Pangbourne woo one for a sunny sail or for a moonlit row, and the country road about is full of beauty. We had intended to push on to Wallingford that day, but the sweet smiling face of the river here lured us to linger for a while, and so we left our boat at the bridge and went up to Streetly and lunched at the Bull, much to Montmorency's satisfaction. They say that the hills on each side of the stream here once joined and formed a barrier across what is now the Thames, and that then the river ended above the Goring in one vast lake. I am not in a position either to contradict or affirm this statement. I simply offer it. It is an ancient place, Streetly, dating back, like most riverside towns and villages, to British and Saxon times. Goring is not nearly so pretty a little spot to stop at as Streetly, if you have your choice. But it is passing fair enough in its way, and is nearer the railway in case you want to slip off without paying your hotel bell.